What's up, guys? Welcome to a Roaring Podcast from Roaring.io, where we talk to some of the best in tech and product management. My name is Jesper Kast, and I'm your host. Today, we are joined by Mats Nogren, the VP of Products at Vilja Solutions, who provide a cloud platform for core banking services. We dive deep into using cloud-based services in heavily regulated industries, how customer data can be used to avoid risk and finding new opportunities, and what the future of financial services looks like. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Okay, so without further ado, uh, welcome Mats Nogren, VP of Products at uh, Vilja Solutions. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. So tell me a little, about, a little bit about yourself and, and the story of Vilja Solutions. So I'm with Vilja Solutions for the last 14 years. We've existed for 15. And we actually started out as um, the supplier of a full core banking system to a newly formed bank, Seven Day Bank. Um, the founders of, of the bank had decided that they wanted to build a, a new process for personal loans uh, in Sweden. Um, they wanted to find a system that was much more automated than they had so far been able to do in the different banks that they had been working before. Uh, and they scanned the market to try to find something that matched their requirements, but they couldn't actually find anything. So uh, that resulted in actually starting a separate company to instead build the system they needed for them. And that company was, at the time, Lindo. Yeah. Um, Later, Vilja Solutions. Uh, Lindo uh, is the name we were founded as, and then uh, the, the name was changed to Vilja Solutions um, just about two years ago. So I think depending on this night, we, we've been known as one or the other, but now we are Vilja Solutions. Okay. And, and from your perspective, uh, in, in terms of banking, and, and you mentioned sort of the start where you tried to find a system and you couldn't find one, so you, so you decided to build one yourself. Uh, how has banking and, and banking systems changed in the last decade or so? It has changed a lot, especially on the Swedish market. Um, a lot have happened. I mean, we can notice just what's happened the last couple of years because of COVID and, and everyone needing to work remotely. But if you go back 15 years, bank ID didn't exist. Internet in your mobile phone was a reasonably new thing. <laughs> it's hard to imagine now, but, but it yeah. actually... There's, there's been a lot happening in the last 15 years. And 15 years ago, the banks, the incumbent banks, the big banks in Sweden, uh, were really the ones controlling the market. And there were very few um, outside that, that could challenge them in, in any way. Uh, there were a few external players from other countries moving in to Sweden. Um, but um, the public as a general, you had one bank, you went there, you got your salary there, you had your mortgage loans, you did your pension savings and all of that, most likely with one bank. That is changing and that has been broken up quite a lot. And um, we're trying to help it along. And, and do you feel that banks... Uh are still sort of cautious when it comes to, you mentioned the, the need uh, for, for new solutions being that uh, a lot of people are working from home and due to the pandemic and, and the situation worldwide. Uh, do you feel that banks are still cautious when it comes to using sort of cloud-based solutions uh, such as the ones that Vilja provide? Banks are and should always be cautious. Uh, they are, are heavily regulated and they are mandated to be cautious. Um, from that perspective, they are still, I would say, a little bit hesitant towards the major cloud providers because they're backed by American companies, all of them. 
and um, with the latest uh, Cloud Act and Safe Harbor um, negotiations that have been between the EU and, and the US, it's still not 100% clear um, how an, an order from a government agency in, in the US will be interpreted by one of the, of the, the cloud suppliers. But these days you can actually create fully cloud native solutions that are completely isolated from the suppliers, the cloud suppliers themselves by encryption, both encryption at rest and encryption in transit. So I would say that today most banks are, are convinced that the cloud is the way to go as a concept, but which cloud? Um, I don't think they have landed that question. There's also a big difference between banks. Some have embraced and accepted cloud completely, and some are still fairly hesitant. Um, I think we will see more national and regional cloud suppliers, perhaps starting to offer their uh, infrastructure as a way to mitigate this. Uh, and of course, the big ones are doing what they can to to offer services that are acceptable to, to all their customers. So far from us, uh, we have been using a local Swedish cloud supplier um, that offers managed Kubernetes services, but that allows us to host and deploy the solutions in Sweden in data centers where you can actually schedule a visit, something that's really hard to do when you're hosting with Amazon or, or uh, Google, um, for obvious reasons. Um, they, they, that's also a good thing because they have very high security, both, both the physical security and, and uh, data logical security. But it makes it hard to fulfill all the requirements from the, the Swedish regulator and the European Banking Association. And you, you sort of mentioned the, uh, in terms of how banking has changed, uh, that, that cha the challengers weren't as common or, or prominent uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, what makes them so successful today, do you think? Deregulation to some sense, or, or even regulation, um, is opening up uh, new avenues and new ways to do financing. Um, PSD2 has opened a lot of different ways, although we're nowhere near the final step where, where banking is available to everyone. But we're seeing more and more of banking instead of being a product on its own, which it is and probably will continue to be for, for major financing, like when you're buying your house. Um, it's become more and more an integral part of some other offering. So f banking and financing becomes embedded within other products. And this wouldn't have been possible to do 15 years ago with uh, the big banks. Um, their systems did not have APIs that would allow it. Um, they were not tailored to partner up with external companies like that. Um, and that has, it's definitely a, a big change in the market. Yeah. Um, all the um, neo banks that are popping up now, they're offering new services uh, ranging from traditional cards, but with special benefits to savings accounts, to crypto and trading. Um, that hinges on a number of, of changes in the market. Yeah. Not the least just the prevalence of our mobile phones um, that we now can have the bank in our pocket. And as well, they, they don't have the, the legacy to to sort of weigh them down, given given that they're new and and can leverage technology in a in a completely different way. 
Yeah. Banking projects traditionally have been very big, very costly, and seldom successful uh, when it comes to replacing the, the core system of, of the bank. Um, the, the, the big banks in Sweden have reacted in, in different ways. Some of them have um, started separate banks themselves that are not weighed down by legacy and given the freedom to invest or build uh, in their own systems, uh, which they have done to, to a larger or, or smaller extent. Yeah. Um, my company, Bilia Solutions, we provide uh, a platform and a number of components for creating these new um, financial products and um, allowing you to invent and, and, and inspire new new types of, of financial solutions that are not only where you, maybe you don't want to spend all the, the time and the effort needed to build the basics, the foundations of what is always needed yeah. when you do like interest calculation and maintaining control of whose money is whose and invoicing and whatnot. Um, most, most new fintechs today, they want to focus on what makes their offering special uh, and the interaction with the customer and uh, making sure that it's a smooth journey and um, we we can provide the sort of the, the building blocks for that yeah and i think that's a that's a really big part for a lot of people uh in terms of customer experience and and uh, a quicker um smoother journey to to both become a customer and being a customer and all the different interactions and trans transactions that you need to uh, conduct as a as a customer uh and and some of these uh, new players on the market are are really creating from scratch seamless uh, seamless solutions in that way uh, where where an onboarding doesn't have to take twenty days and and include multiple manual steps and and analog steps. Um, what's your take on that? Especially this is is something that would not have been at all possible. Um, five years ago, because if we're looking at specifically onboarding a company onto your services, uh, if you're in financial services, that comes with a lot of obligations. Uh, you need to have a very good understanding of what the company is, what they do and how they do business, who are the owners, uh, what is the constitution of the board, um, are there any PEPs, so politically exposed persons, uh, in the in the ownership or on the board, uh, and so on? Uh, and doing that five years ago, and to be honest, for most banks today, is yeah. a very much manual process uh, of collecting a lot of background information, verifying it against what the company has said and making sure that you cross all the T's and dot the the I's and then collecting all the signatures needed to actually set things up. Today, that can be automated um, among other things because companies like you guys, Roaring, um, can provide external information in a format that you can act on uh, and not just as as papers or PDFs that you could download or, or uh, reports that you could review. So, um, and that's, that's a new thing. Yeah. And I think that's what we hear from, from a lot of the companies that we talk to that that's the sort of the, the main benefit is that the, the performance of these processes, such as onboarding just rapidly improves when you can, can uh, shorten its length and, and uh, remove obstacles by, automating and digitizing and, and using data um, and it also provides a, a, a comfort in, in the process quality uh, uh, you don't have to to uh, to be afraid of, of these sort of manual mistakes or or uh, 
uh, risk assessment uh, deviations, uh, so to speak. But tell us a little bit about uh, when we're on the subject of data. How how does data play a role in 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 your solution? What what role does it play? Um, the the first part is absolutely during since the services that our, our platform provides revolve around deposits and loans. So doing any of those initially uh, starts with understanding how to onboard a new customer. And like we just talked about, you need to figure a lot of things out about, you need to ask all these questions that banks always keep asking you and you keep wondering, why do I have to tell you all this? But they actually legally mandated to ask you these things, both as a consumer and, and and as a, as a company, if they are taking on new customers. So doing that and, and, and in an automated fashion, being able to, to collect all this information, it, it is very dependent on external information providers and data like yourselves. Um, and all the underlying data providers like Bulogs, like and Spar and um, credit bureaus and whatnot, um, that the ecosystem of, of information suppliers that feed and, and get aggregated by players such as Roaring, um, in order to, uh, create and risk assess the customer before taking them on board. It's both risk assessing the customer and then risk assessment and, and, evaluating the, the risk for money laundry and so on uh, for, for example, a loan. So it's both credit risk and, and other types of risk that needs to be handled during the origination processing. But then once the customer is on board, um, maybe you've paid out the loan and you're just collecting repayments, uh, you're monitoring the behavior of the customer they also need external data because again you are mandated to check does the customer behave as you expect as he has said that he would if he is a deposit customer is he depositing money as frequently or infrequently as he initially said he would uh, are the sums reasonable um are you getting paid um, in a reasonable speed compared to what this company is doing and, and, and how the business is doing right now? So to be able to monitor that, you'd need an, a constant feed of, of, of information around your customers to be able to continue to assess them. And make sure that they don't deviate from the original risk assessment, for example. Yeah. And, and now I'm only talking from a, like the negative standpoint, the, 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 <laughs> the, the risk yes. standpoint, which is what a lot of our customers <laughs> tend to focus on. Yeah, but then yeah. you have the other, the other side of things. And, and this is where I think much more will happen um, by understanding and analyzing the situation of the customer and the behavior that they pose. You will be able to provide more services. Yeah. You will be able to um, suggest um, your services at the time when the customer needs them the most. And, and so that, um, and that could be tied in with both how the customer consumes services, but also from other signals in the, in the environment. Like if you have a company customer and you get information that uh, they have just made a split. So there's something is happening with their stock or there's been a change in the board composition or something yeah. else. That could of course be a, a, a risk indicator, but it could just as well be something yeah, else. It could be an indicator yeah. that an opportunity for you to provide additional services. So monitoring and understanding your customers that way. Yeah. 
yeah, I think that's a lot. Of, uh, a lot of good B two C companies uh, are already providing sort of those tailored solutions when it comes to to e commerce, for example. Um, but but you rarely see it in in B two B settings. No, but if it's one thing that, that we have learned is that you learn new behaviors as a customer, as a consumer, and then you bring those. Uh, habits and those behaviors with you to work and you start questioning if it was this easy to order my new thing from Amazon as a consumer, yeah. why should it be just as easy when I'm working? And that I think is one of the big change forces that, that that's affecting the market right now. Yeah. Customer expectations are just changing all the time. And like you say, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, sort of experience that you, that you have in, in a B2C setting and in, in an e-commerce setting or, or whatever it is, you, you bring it with you uh, to work for sure. Uh, and you expect that to, to apply to, to other situations. Um, yeah. So, so how do you, uh, in your product and your solution and in terms of the data requirements that we spoke about, how do you, how do you enable that? How do you enable your customers to uh, to be able to to collect and verify and monitor this this data over time, mainly by trying to to build a platform and a and a, an ecosystem of friends of partners that can help us to supply all of these little pieces and and being able to to aggregate and, and act upon them in the system. We don't stand the chance of trying to collect all this information ourselves. We need to rely on on a, a large ecosystem of of the information suppliers. Um, and ID suppliers that can have ways of interacting that allows us to broaden our scope. So if we, if we build a way to fetch the board composition for Swedish companies, it's very good if we can bring that functionality with us when we um, expand into a new country and start offering services in Denmark or in Poland or in some other European country. Um, So that's what we're looking for generally partners that again support us and grow with us both in terms of regional growth but also if we build a solution for consumers we can reapply it for companies if we build a a solution for um, communicating to a customer um, in regards to their loan configuration uh, we can use the same methods and the same um, the same platform components when the customer is a, a consumer who's depositing money. So it's, uh, it's a question of having good partners and yeah. building a, a stable platform. Yeah. Creating that ecosystem and, and hopefully building some cohesion around it, because I suppose that your customers would want, or require the same data in in uh, Norway and, and Sweden, for example. Uh, so I guess I guess that plays in as well. Yeah, very much so. Mm. And, and and moving on a little bit, uh, what is if you were to sort of look broadly at banking and and uh, and and the way things are done today, what are the sort of biggest challenges and problems that you think banks are facing today? I think it's, uh, to begin with, it's really hard for me to address banks in general because we only work with a portion of all the services that a, a major bank offers. So those things that are centered around loans and savings and to some extent payments. Um, there, there are lots of other services outside of that. Uh, regarding investments and international exchange and, and card issuing and whatnot that, that we don't do. So I can't really speak for those. But I think the biggest challenge is for the incumbent banks, for the big banks today, 
is um, the many the many new engines that are coming onto the Swedish market, both uh, local efforts and international players that are coming in and starting to focus on just single services. Um, like we started niche, out saying, traditionally you, we, yeah, when you when you be when you're a customer with a bank, traditionally that's where you get your salary, that's where you get your house mortgage, that's where you put your pension money, and so on and so forth. And it's a changed behavior with customers that they are starting to accept the fact that they shop around. Maybe they will go for the best interest rate, regardless of where they bank, um, for their mortgage, for their savings accounts, picking the best credit card that has the best kickback, and so on. Um, and that is it's a definite change for, for the big banks because they have been used to that. The customer is a customer of all of their services. And so that means not all of them need to be as profitable because they can always subsidize each other. But uh, it's just a quite a matter of time, I think, before you are going to have to start paying the bank money for having your salary account there because they can no longer subsidize that from the other services. So they're getting eaten in small portions from, from different directions. Um, so far, I don't think it's, it's a major problem for them, but uh, it, it could be if it turns out to continue in this direction. Yeah. And where do you think they should go in, in terms of how to deal with this as a bank? Uh, what's the main sort of sort of tip that you could give them? <laughs> hmm. I'm not the one to give give them <laughs> tips, um, but we can see that, that you can see that different banks. They yeah they have they have different strategies. Um, by now, even Handelsbanken have sort of until fairly recently they persisted in saying that we have the local connection we have local engagement and uh, the the offices where we can meet our customers and, and that's our differentiator and even they and they were probably the last uh have now said that it we do so much more business online and the customer requests our presence online that it just doesn't there's no way to to maintain the cost of all these offices so even they are moving in line so so everyone is trying to strengthen their digital experience uh making it more making the different services available through through more channels and everyone has an app obviously um but Still, not all services are available there. Uh, I got slightly annoyed today already. I got a mail from my bank saying, hey, we've sent you a message, but you can't read it in the app. So they sent me <laughs> yeah, that's a classic one. I have a message and I can't read it in the app. I have to figure out a way to go onto their web yeah. to be able to read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they still have a lot to do with their, their channel concept and, and, and meeting the customer where the customer wants to meet. Yeah, I think that's a big one for sure. Um, they have to speed up. Uh, one thing when you're working with banks and the, the, the big traditional banks in general is getting used to the speed or lack of that they act with most of the time. Um, things that you as coming from the IT side of things and being a tech entrepreneur would expect be something you could set up in a number of days 
are yeah. typically calendarized a number of months because it's always been that way. And that has to change. Um, otherwise, I don't see how they can survive. And, and what's the uh, what's next for for Vilja as a solution provider and a platform? What what kind of processes are you looking to integrate and and digitize and automate into your sort of building blocks? Right now, we're we're spending quite a lot of, of time building and extending this onboarding process we talked about uh, for what you need to do when you bring new company customers on board. Um, we're focusing right now on, on small and medium sized enterprises um, because the requirements look fairly different from when you're bringing Ericsson as a new customer on board. Uh, the kind of due diligence you need to do then is substantially more complicated. Um, so that's one of the processes. And we're also looking at expanding our platform is, is a collection of, let's say, 60 uh, business-oriented microservices that each provide different capabilities that is necessary when you want to build financial applications. But what we've also done is we have, from those components, put together what is currently six major products ranging from savings and deposits to, to mortgage loans and a lot of things in between um, in order to be able to very quickly launch and, and roll out new products uh, based on, on those six templates. Sort of. we, we're uh, trying to extend that portfolio of pre-cooked products that we can that we can change and adapt through configuration for individual customers. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at adding more packaging around that, and also adding more more capabilities. Um, regional rollout is always interesting. So being able to address new companies in new countries for new markets, um, we are most likely rolling out a new customer in Norway uh, in the near future. Um, that is, uh, has meant that there are new integrations needed to be able to support the local conditions for Norwegian customers and payment systems and, and uh, regional limitations of various kinds. Um, it's always ex exciting there's, when you expand there's, them. There's lots of interesting <laughs> things to do. There's, there's yeah. no, uh, always, no shortage always. of things. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. And uh, what is the, in your opinion, what does the future hold for, for sort of core banking and, and the sort of services and systems and all that we have spoken about today? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, uh, before going into finance and fintech, uh, I, I come from a background of having done a lot of work within telecoms. Um, if you go even further back, uh, around the time when GSM was rolled out over the world, there was a lot of talk about how um, operators and GSM operators in special um, would become commoditized. Uh, the customer would no longer know who they were because it would just be, the phone would just be like a bit pipe. It allowed you to connect to the internet and who cares what operator you have and so on. So for a long time, many people thought that, that the operators would, would, uh, almost grow out of existence or become faceless. Um, but that hasn't really happened. They have still, they have maintained their position and their customer relations. And I think there's a similar thing <laughs> happening in it for the banks. Um, the banks are doing a similar kind of work 
they're maintaining a lot of very expensive, very complicated, low-level functionality that most customers don't have any idea of why it's there or how it works. Just as most customers have no idea how how your GSM call goes to the next phone. Don't really care as long as they pick up when you call them. Um, and, and maintaining and keeping that infrastructure is, is complicated, especially since finance is so heavily regulated. So making sure you, you follow all the principles is, is a, it's a, it's a costly thing. Yeah. Um, but it also means that, that it's really hard to compete on the, on the low level with the banks. Uh, when it comes to doing that kind of work, because you need to, to comply with all the regulations and they have all the systems and they have all the processes. So, so they really they are stronger than many people think. And you just need to compare with what has happened on the telecom market to say that it's, it's quite reasonable that they will be able to maintain their, their hold on the market um, and to be able to retain the, the consumer if they focus on the consumer, which is what the, the telecoms companies have done. And in focusing on the consumer, where, where we, did, we discussed previously the sort of the digital experience as a key factor, uh, as customer experience or customer expectations are, are changing. And... Yeah, doing that and, and partnering together with new companies that can offer new services together with you. So just like Spotify would never have been uh, the success story that they are if they didn't have mobiles that could run their app uh, and operators that allowed them to initially sell their app to to the consumer. Um, in the long run, having Spotify makes your phone better and makes your operator more worthwhile. Um, there will be Spotify's on the financial market and they will be working. They will probably not be the big banks, but they will be working together with the big banks to roll out new services that we still haven't really seen. Yeah, we're seeing sort of a shift towards that with the banks uh, starting their own innovative uh, studios and and companies, uh, as well as uh, acquiring other companies uh, in order to sort of secure their their future in a way um so it's 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 there's sort of a shift happening there i think yeah um and, and i think that's very very forward looking by the banks at least some of the banks starting to take a stake in, in many many promising fintechs they don't necessarily need to perhaps own them completely but just having a stake and to be able to yeah. to influence the direction um, that's something that's uh, really interesting and Sweden is very far ahead on the fintech yeah, scene at the front of that yeah uh, if we compare with what's happening in Europe in general Sweden and the Nordics are the least conservative um, the most willing to try new things. And it's so much enabled by having this um, ID infrastructure that we have made into everyone's property. Uh, that we have bank ID in Sweden, uh, we have bank ID and, and FTN and so on in, in Finland and in Norway. That each company don't have to solve that particular problem. They can go on to the next level of problems and offer new solutions. Where That means we're way ahead of, of many of the European countries where you first have to solve that problem for yourself because there's no common solution. It's something that, that gives Swedish fintechs a head start when trying to roll out the services uh, towards other European countries because they got a maturity that these countries they haven't been able to acquire. For sure, for sure. 
So uh, if we were to to sort of, for the listeners, just sort of uh, uh, give some closing thoughts, what would you leave them with from this talk? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Put you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Um, things will continue to change. Um, COVID has accelerated things in ways that we have not yet seen the end of. Um, and the way that we are now, uh, from, from, from a financial perspective, uh, it used to be that customers were okay with acquiring services in the old way. So you maybe went to your bank and you opened a new account and then you consumed your services online or digitally. But that's no longer acceptable in, in a world where you don't leave home. <laughs> um, you need to be able to both acquire and consume your services in a fully digital environment. And that's something that everyone needs to think about for the coming years. Uh, if you cannot enable that customer journey, then you are going to be irrelevant in three to five years, unless you're the next door grocer. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Mats. It was uh, great having you on. Um, and I think we, we provided some, some uh, cool insights for the people listening. Uh, so thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon again. That sounds so. Thank you. You've been listening to an episode of a Roaring podcast by Roaring IO. Feel free to share it with your friend, colleague, or peer if you liked it. If you wish to stay connected to us, don't forget to subscribe to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time.